All right, so. Went to the House of Representatives. A lot of Federalists were like, let's get rid of Jefferson. As much as we don't like Burr. But some Federalists were like, you know, as much as we don't like Jefferson, the people, the electors wanted Jefferson. Everybody acknowledges that. Burr should drop out. And then one very important, very influential Federalist, and this you have to get down, Alexander Hamilton. This is my grading that's my key. So just hold on to that. Hamilton threw his support. Hamilton with Federalists. Yeah. Threw his support to Jefferson. More a better way to look at it is he convinced Federalists in the House, you gotta vote for Jefferson. Or at least abstain. Because Burr is a scoundrel. Burr is a man who cannot be trusted. And it worked. Two states did not vote, and Thomas Jefferson was elected president. This really could have been a massive constitutional crisis. And Burr would never forgive. Never. They already didn't like each other. Burr heard what Hamilton said about it. And then, a few years later, Burr, who's now the vice president, tried to run for governor of New York. Hamilton did everything he could to make sure Burr wasn't elected, and Hamilton succeeded. Succeeded. Burr was not elected governor of New York. And it started a really nasty letter writing campaign where they wrote to friendly newspapers and they criticized each other till eventually it got to the point where Hamilton called Burr a liar. He would not recant, and Burr challenged him to endure. And that is why in 1804, Burr, the vice president of the United States, would assassinate, or not assassinate, murder Alexander Hamilton. And that's how it happened. I'll tell you a little bit more about how they fought the duel after you get back from your, your long two-day break, four-day break. Because I'm going to tell you about duels and I'm going to talk about Andrew Jackson because he fought over 100, so that's a good time to talk about it then. Now, Jefferson's president, and they dubbed this. Oh, almost forgot something. <laughs> if you look at the vote, 73 to 65 in Electoral College. But the South had more electors because of the three fifths compromise. There were still slaves in the North, but most of the slaves were in the South. If they only counted whites as citizens, I know this sounds horribly racist. It is horribly racist. But many in the North said only whites should be counted. If they only counted whites for representation, the vote would have been 65 for Adams, set or 63 for Jefferson. Jefferson would have been elected, or Adams would have been elected president, president if there was no three-fifths compromise. Has everyone got that? They were furious about this. This is called slave power. And that's what Northerners called it. Slave power. It's not that the slaves had power, it's the slave holders. Remember, the slaves are only counted as population towards representation. They could not vote or hold elected office. Northerners, behind his back, and sometimes very open, like this cartoon from 1801, called Jefferson the Negro president because of slave power. And here they have him as the rooster around a flock of slaves, which gave him power. Back then, they always drew slaves with a turban. Everybody from Africa with a turban, which makes no sense. Nobody in sub saharan Africa wears turbans, but they did all the time. Yeah. Wait, I have a question about the duel. Like, what's the point of a duel if you're not trying to kill them? You said something like duels usually thrown off like and people dying. Yeah. And then you said No, the duel is about preserving honor. And I'll tell you more about how that works, but you you don't fight duel because you want to kill somebody. You fight duel because your honor has been infringed. They have and you need to preserve your honor. So you are trying to like kill them though. Not necessarily. Are you trying to hit them or not? Not necessarily. You're just trying to protect your honor. 
you're willing to fight for your honor, that might be enough. So you don't have to shoot them. You just say, I'm here to defend my honor. I will go home. Remember, not everyone, they don't necessarily want to kill somebody. Some are homicidal murder maniacs. Bird is, yeah. And I'll tell you exactly how, I'll tell you the whole story of the duel, okay? okay. All right, so he's called Slave, this is called Slave Hall. Northerners are going to be upset about this. Really upset. For the next 60 years, it's been a, they're going to fume about Slave Hall. A number of laws that clearly protected and expanded slavery would be passed because of slave power. This is a major issue. And Southerners became infuriated by cartoons like this. And this is the other thing we have to get down. Southerners became convinced that all this talk of slave power was a direct attack on their very way of life. Meaning the system of slavery. Attacks on slave power, or, or the, <coughs> the North calling it slave power, and cartoons like this, directly attacks the Southern way of life. And it's the way the South looked at it is, you're attacking our very way of life, the North hates us. They're going to destroy slavery and destroy us. And the South became more and more paranoid about things like this. So you can imagine what's going to happen in 30 years when there's a movement to end slavery called the abolitionist movement. To the South, this is like a declaration of war. <coughs> the South is going to get more and more paranoid because of this. Because they're defending a horrific system and they're trying desperate to figure out ways to do it. Well, now Jefferson is president. And slavery is one of the many things. Jefferson has all these contradictions. But they're going to call it, his supporters, right now, the Revolution of 1800. The reason they called it the Revolution of 1800 was not that it was a radical shift. The Republicans kept most of the Federalist programs. They kept most of them. So there wasn't a big deal there. But what the revolution was this, and this had really never happened, at least in anybody's memory, that you could have two groups, in this case, the Federalists and Republicans. And one group, the Federalists, they willingly gave up power to an opposition in a peaceful transference of power. Now today, that seems relatively normal. But back then, that's revolutionary. You could have a change in power to an opposition group and the country continues to go on. Has everyone got that? That's the revolution. And in many ways, it was. Today, it doesn't seem like one. Why it is here? Because the country was saved. It survives because we have this system. Others would copy it, but we have a little bit of this. Washington willingly gave up power in 1797, but Adams was an ally for the most part. So this wasn't a big shift. Adams was so mad, he didn't go to the inauguration. He thought Jefferson was going to destroy the country. He's one of two presidents to not go to the inauguration of their successor. Did I mention this before? Who's the other one? His, his son, John Quincy Adams, wouldn't go to Andrew Jackson's inauguration. It's family thing. They were a little emotional. They kind of went up and down. Adams were interesting truth. Yeah. So what was the revolution? The, the Federalists giving power? Yeah, the Federalists willingly give it power, peacefully transfers. So a peaceful transference of power to the Republicans. Okay. And not that there was a huge difference, but they did have a different view. And now we're going to very quickly talk about the philosophy of, of Thomas Jefferson. He laid it out in his inauguration, and the philosophy is a bunch of things that his ideal of the United States, which in many ways would be the ideal of the United States, and a lot of us to this day, <coughs> especially to the Great Depression, number one, the first part, trust in the common man. We talked about this before you saw it in the video. His first president to shake hands. And remember, common man did not mean average common man meant not born of noble birth. But the reason I put down there is Jackson dressed, or Jefferson dressed relatively plainly. I would say kind of like uh, either stained or ripped breeches he would wear, things like that. But he really wasn't a common man. And it showed this contradiction. He like wanted to act like one. He talked about tillers of the soil and things like that. That's his home at Monticello. 
beautiful place if you get a chance. How many stories is that? And by the way, he loved the classics. So a copy, it was a, it's called the, uh, the Republic style, columns like ancient Rome and a dome like ancient Rome. How many stories is that? It's supposed to look like two from a distance. But when you get close, one, two, five. Yeah, common base. Five. One, two, three, four. Wait a minute. The windows are huge. So from a distance, it looks like a one-story window. The door is like 17 feet high. So the idea is from a distance, it looks like the house of a relatively prosperous, but not a rich elite. Right? Does it look like a one-story, neat place? You get it closer, it's a huge mansion. It looks a lot smaller than what it really is. He had this illusion. And this showed a lot of the contradictions. Yes, Jefferson talked about the common man. He by no means was a common man. Next, number two, this agrarian lifestyle. Farmers, and he would obsess about farmers. And they were yeomen. Yeomen! Yeomen! Yeomen. Yeoman. That's fun to say. Try it. Yeoman. Try it! Yeoman! Say yeoman. Yeoman? Yeoman. Yeah. Independent farmers. They own their own land. Yeoman. Yeoman. Yeah, yeoman. Yeoman. They're independent farmers. They own their own land. That's why he's kind of a rural ideal. And the reason why is an independent farmer, they're truly free. They're independent, so they have life. No, they they make their own living, so they have freedom of conscience, liberty, and therefore they can decide their own path. Pursuit of happiness. If somebody is, and that's why he's anti wage slave, as he called wage earners were slaves, because they're dependent upon somebody else for their livelihood. So they have to act in a certain way, do a certain thing, or they're fired. They have to give up a significant amount of all of their rights to work. He was not necessarily opposed to industry. In fact, he liked machines, he was an inventor. He didn't like the idea of one person owning it all and hiring workers as wages. That's why he feared urban. He feared banks. He feared debt because of this. And this fits into the fear of debt too. Oh, and that's a great shot. That's from the 19th century of this independent, hardworking farmer. But you notice he's kind of like the master of his domain. He's above everything, yet he's not anything special. He's like every one of us if they want to work hard. Frugal. What's frugal mean? Yeah. yeah. Save money as much as you can. He wanted to cut government spending, but Jefferson had an absolutely uh, intense, overwhelming fear of debt. The fear of debt. Remember the assumption bill and how Hamilton wanted to raise debt? He wanted to cut back on debt. And so, for example, they cut back on military spending that went up during the Quasi War with France. This is West Point, that fort above New York. It's still 19 years for being a military academy, but they cut back on the Army and the Navy. A lot of these ships were mothballed. This is a great ship called the Constellation. They rebuilt it, and now it's right near Fort McHenry, Baltimore, where the Star Spangled Banner was written. If you get a chance, go. It's really cool. Yeah. So these are all. Like it's things. philosophy. Oh, okay. And the thing I hated for debt is this. As he saw, if the government owes debt down the road, they got to figure out ways to pay off that debt, and they'll hamstring them down the road. And he was looking at personal experience. He had overwhelming, crushing debt. All farmers do. He had overwhelming. He was. He uh, had everything more each to the hill. His slaves, his land, and his house, all in debt. And the thing about it is, is because of this debt, he's basically a slave. Debtors are enslaved in a lot of ways. To who? Yeah, the creditor, whoever owns their debt. He can't do a lot of things he might want to do. You really aren't independent if you got to pay a debt. Because you got to get whatever job you can get and pay off that debt. And that's one of the things about how life has changed for you compared to what I went through. 
I mean, it's so much different that it's almost unbelievable that we that um, that we're in the same country, and no one ever talks about it. The debt issue today compared to what it was then. I mean, you know, God, the average college students that come out of college uh, by the end of this year are thirty six thousand dollars in debt. Boy, does that limit your options, doesn't it? You can't say, oh, you know, I'm going to go do something to help people or travel the world. No. you got to get the first job you can get. You can't complain because you've got to pay off that debt. I didn't have that issue. Colleges weren't. We made a decision. When I was in school, we were still in a country that we're going to help people go to school. We're now in a country like, wish you luck. It's kind of sad, but i phrase this kind of, that kind of sad. It's, uh, we're mortgaging your future, and I don't like it. By the way, I say that, what kind of decision was that? Who made that decision? Wasn't it the first time? There was one college that was only prices never else called. I mean, this, they made it, you're talking about private schools. It's not politicians. These are political decisions. So they can be changed, obviously, but you guys have to vote, right? right. You're going to vote? This is one of these little truisms in society. Those who don't vote, don't count. And that's college age, don't vote. They have the right to vote, but they don't vote. So, whatever. This is one of these. It doesn't have to be that way. He believed that. But let me say one thing about Jefferson and debt. He's wrong about the government, and he never understood this. Governments aren't the same as people. People have debt. A person with debt is a lot different than a country with debt. People don't have the ability to make laws, armies, polices, the power to tax, the power to print money. Government debt doesn't necessarily work the same way it does with people. It's a lot different of an entity. So he never understood that. And so that's something that Jefferson was thinking personal experiences when governments aren't people. By definition, the federal government debt's different than your debt or my debt. Next, he feared this large central government. That's probably the reason why it's frugal. Spend less, government smaller. Why do you fear the large central government? That's how you correctly spell government in America. Government. He feared the large central government. Because, well, first off, he wanted the policy of, you know, in French, it's laissez-faire. But since we're in America, and it's more kind of an economics term that's used most of the time, and all my economics teachers pronounce it this way, laissez-faire, and I'll say both ways and not even realize I'm doing it, that means hands off by government. Laissez-faire or laissez-faire means hands off by government. Basically what Jefferson was hoping, if government doesn't make a lot of regulations to get involved too much in the economy, he understood the government has to be involved for economies to function. But it'll help poor farmers because he believed government, an interactive government, will only help wealthy, especially wealthy merchants. What was his example? He's not doing this just simply saying, you're sitting on top of his dome going, hmm, I wonder what would happen. You're know, pondering his navel and thinking these things. What specific thing would be his reason to justify this attitude that government helps only wealthy? The whiskey, the whiskey tax or the national bank. What else did Hamilton want to do to keep out uh, imports? Say it again. We want to help the merchants. But what was the thing that to keep out imports? Yeah, the tariff, which would help merchants. Yeah, he had specific examples. He said, see? And so if we don't have a large government, it'll help small farmers. As it turns out, nothing might work that way either. But that was his belief. That's Washington, D.C. And the reason I chose this is part of the reason why he wanted it in a rural area. 1800 is just a few buildings. In fact, this picture from 1800 is exaggerated. Adams was the first president. There is the executive mansion. It's gone now. But the executive mansion where President Adams and Jefferson will live, and Madison. Why is it gone now? No. Why is it gone? 
got burned down. Who burned it down? The British. Yeah, the British. The West. Somebody didn't read their book very carefully. Have to go to outlining the book. What? Not a bad idea. Maybe I should say that. The West. He was also obsessed with the West. Remember? He's a plantation owner. And that's why I put this in here. Picture of the happy slave working in the tobacco plantation. This is from like 1740. Plantation owners are obsessed with land. Because remember what tobacco cultivation does to land? It just uses it up. So Jefferson, in fact, Monticello faces West. And he did that on purpose because he's thinking the U.S. is going to expand westward. But there's something else. Jefferson wants land for all these small farmers. You got that. Jefferson wants land for the yeomen. Well, where do you get the land? Well, it goes a twofold thing. Because those right there are Shawnee Indians. This is the land Jefferson's talking about. All this wonderful land here. <coughs> but what about the powerful American Indian tribes here and here? What are you going to do with them? He wanted all this to do what with the Indians here? To move from here. And that was his plan. That part you have to get. Jefferson, part of the reason he wanted more land <coughs> was to move the American Indians. He believed this would be more than enough. Then someday down the road, maybe the American Indians can be assimilated in. And so, Jefferson was no dumb. He knew exactly what it meant if we're going to have land to move them. So they acquired Louisiana, which when he became president was still part of Spain, a Spanish claim. The United States acquires that. If they're going to make these powerful tribes move, how are you going to do it? Hmm? Yeah, point of a gun. And if they resist, what? Kill them. Kill and move. And he knew it. That's his policy. There's a term for it in the 20th century to today it's called ethnic cleansing. You just get rid of them by using terror. And that's exactly what's going to happen. And it starts with Jefferson. Now, did you everyone get that down about American Indians? So I look at Zach's notes, I'll see American Indians written down. Thank you. Good. All right. But the most important part of this policy was pragmatic. Jefferson was very flexible. He might say one thing, but would do other things. Jefferson and pragmatic. Pragmatic means practical. Now, if everybody just wrote the word pragmatic down, that's not enough. Make sure you get prag it's practical. You'll make decisions based upon the problem at hand. So Jefferson might have said he believed in a strict interpretation of the Constitution, but when a chance came up to right here is the treaty negotiation by Louisiana, he found a way to avoid the problem that the Constitution had, to his point of view. Didn't say the U.S. could buy land. It also didn't say what the land would become. He just used the necessary rubber clause and wrote a treaty. Against the Barbary pirates in North Africa, when they were stopping American ships because the U.S. refused to pay a bribe, he didn't ask for a declaration of war. He sent in the the very tiny U.S. Marines and Navy. They even attacked the city of Tripoli. Never got that to the Barbary Wars. No declaration of war, the very same thing that he attacked the Federalists for. By the way, what do you call somebody who says one thing and then does another? Hypocrite. So he's going to be accused of a hypocrite the entire time. But he's also very practical. The most successful presidents in American history have been practical. Oh, and the last thing, slavery. He knew slavery was wrong. He knew it. But he still kept slaves. He did policy to have slaves. All right, we'll finish this. Oh, quiz. The quiz was going to be tomorrow, but I want to talk about the uh, outside. That would take a lot of half the period. So the quiz is going to be Monday. There are 14 questions. Are we ever going to be one of those with a paragraph and then one that short idea I gave you? Sound good? Be 9 and 10. No, no, I'm sorry. 8 and 9. 8 and 9. Thank you what we've been talking about in class the last four days. The purchase.
the, the Constitution doesn't say how the U.S. can acquire land, so we just use the treaty power. Actually, that wasn't even the biggest argument, then, but it's one people who was <laughs> These pirates were attacking Americans because they didn't get the bribe. Yeah, they wanted a bribe, and Washington and Adams paid the bribe. And they did, well, Jefferson thought that was wrong to pay a tribute. But then what happened was that they started attacking more American merchant owned vessels in the Mediterranean. So he sent a couple of naval ships and about 2,000 Marines to attack Tripoli. No declaration of war. And that's what he attacked the Federalist for during the Quasar. It's French. So, use the treaty. The treaty made me power to uh, acquire land. Because it never said anywhere in the Constitution how the government would acquire land. Mm -hmm. You bet. I did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 